Thank you all so much for joining this second Reimagine Review community call, uh, where we will be discussing how transparency can improve quality and peer review or make quality obvious. Uh, so it's Peer Review Week uh, 2019, and we have assembled a wonderful group of speakers here to talk about initiatives they're working on uh, to illuminate the inner workings of peer review in different ways. So we'll hear very brief comments from all of them and then move into a phase where uh, others can ask questions. We can have an a open discussion uh, about how this transparency is uh, is affecting our ability to interpret quality and peer review and what that means in the first place. Um, but before moving uh, to our speakers, I want to first introduce Victoria Yan, who is a coordinator of Reimagine Review, and she will tell you a little bit about that project uh, before we, we move on and, and how it's related to the goals of, of Peer Review Week. So Victoria, take it away. Hi, uh, thank you, Jessica. So Reimagine Review is a registry of innovative peer review initiatives. So these include many innovative projects headed by journals, as well as independent projects. And another aspect of this is that we're working together also with meta researchers of peer review. So we wanted to organize this registry and also create a community and use that as a platform to convene these discussions in this actually very engaged community. And we have already had one um, very successful community call on bias. And we're happy to discuss um, using transparency um, and increasing transparency and how that could improve the quality of peer review for the special peer review week. And um, to start off with, I will welcome our first speaker, uh, Chris Jackson, who is a professor of geology at Imperial College of London. And he's a very um, prominent advocate for assigning peer reviews. So we'll uh, hand it over to Chris. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> okay, great. Yeah, no, so yeah, my name's Chris Jackson at Imperial College. I'm an earth scientist and it's probably relevant because a lot of what I say may have some, some field specificity to it. So this is one of the things I've learned in these discussions around signing peer reviews is different communities uh, act in different ways, it seems. So I, I just wanted to tell you a little bit about my history with peer review and then kind of what my what my personal view is. So. I did my first ever peer review at the end of my PhD and my supervisor said to me at the time, of course you sign it. There was never even a discussion in his head. He'd signed all of his reviews. So he just said, well, you did the review. You should tell them what you said and write your name on it. So I was kind of hardwired into me from the beginning that that was an important thing to do. However, having intended to sign that peer review, the joke is that I then forgot to type my name at the bottom of the Word document because it was so long ago. It was before web-based review submission was actually um, like that popular. So you physically sent back a copy of the manuscript. And so there was none of this like type your name in a box and you'll be disclosed. So there was some irony around my initial review that I didn't end up signing it because then when I subsequently met the author of the paper and said, oh, I you know, enjoyed your paper. I hope my comments were useful. He said, oh, did you review it? I didn't know because whoever it was was anonymous. So I always felt quite guilty about, about that. Um, but since that first kind of erroneous, you know, kind of attempt to do peer review, I've probably done a few hundred peer reviews in my time in 15 years, say, maybe a few more. Uh, I've signed all of them um, and for journals of every, you know, type, um, for proceedings from conferences, for everything. I, I, just, I just write them and sign them. And, you know, my personal motivation is, 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 is many fold. So, um, it helps me moderate my tone. You know, I like the adage that you should never write anything down in peer review that you wouldn't be willing to say to somebody's face. Um, so it, it kind of keeps you on a constructive track that the purpose of peer review is for you to help the authors improve their science so that it's ultimately published. It's not an opportunity to block. It's an opportunity that, okay, it may take them a few more submissions, but ultimately you're, you've got a key role in trying to get them to that. Um, and, you know, and it's also an opportunity for me to kind of demonstrate to the community and to those authors that I've taken their work seriously, I'm engaged in it. Um, and so it's kind of a validation for me as a reviewer in that sense that actually it's part of my professional credit I can build with my community is by demonstrating my expertise and, and my commitment to, to improve things. And if you're anonymous, I feel that's a, a, a major omission that 
could then benefit you later in your career through reference letters, recommendation letters, you know, just your general, your general sort of um, standing in the community. Also for me, signing it helps with my general mental positivity. You know, all the stories about people being fearful of signing reviews because of all the backlash and therefore they, they don't sign any. For me, I would find it very hard to operate in, this, in, a, in an environment where I was continuously concerned that everything could actually have no reward, it was always risk. Um, so that's a personal thing, but it, but it is one reason why I, I kind of fully commit to signing all my reviews. In terms of negatives I've experienced, there's been a couple of post-publication or post-publication or post-review emails and barroom discussions where, but I honestly can count them probably on one hand where I've experienced uh, some negativity coming back to me. Um, and, you know, there's been never any obvious retaliation in review. I've, you know, I've never sensed that, or it's been very hard to correlate between a negative anonymous review we've had, because inevitably they're always anonymous, the really negative and, 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 and spitefully written ones, um, and a review that, you know, a, a review I did in the past. So, um, and, you know, just to, just to finish on the, on, the, on the positives, there's many. I've had lots of post-review email exchanges. I, we liked your review. Um, oh, by the way, you recommended this paper. We can't get hold of it. Or you said this and we didn't understand. Could you clarify? And there was loads, you know, it was just an awesome feeling that you were part of the, the process to get that paper published. And the anonymity, all the smoke and mirrors and all the kind of dark, smoky rooms, and it's all secretly done. I, you know, I prefer the doors to be open you know so that we actually work together uh, and 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 we're fully responsible for what we're what we're doing positively and negatively in the peer review process so um yeah that's sort of my 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 story about and my view about peer review and you know just all the phd students i work with now and early career scientists i recommend to all of them they sign their reviews and they unanimously all do um, you know, and we have this discussion. I send them to resources where there's lots of people saying why you shouldn't, and I but I articulate the positives. And I think that's the the big thing that's missing in a lot of this discussion about open peer review is the positive things that can come from doing it. I think too often we hear the you know the threats and this will happen and this will happen. It will all be negative, but it's never happened to me or anybody I know. But that's what I heard. But we need to be telling more positive stories. So um, that's what I'm here for. Thank you. Great. Right. Oh, thank you. Go ahead, Victoria. Oh, okay. I don't. We're in, are we asked? We're not asking questions till later, right? Oh yeah. Um, I think we should probably hold questions to make sure we can get through okay. everyone's um, uh, bits. But if if you are willing to hold questions, that would be great. You can also feel free to drop them in the chat if you want, so we can have them, um, you know, to hold for later. Um, but uh, next, I want to introduce Quincy Justman. She's editor in chief of Cell Systems, and uh, they are now experimenting with uh, transparent peer review, so publishing peer review. Thanks for joining us, Quincy. Yeah. Hi, uh, thanks so much for the, um, the invitation to be here. And Chris, just to say, I, I love the view of science that um, you just gave us, and um, I wish all people shared it. So I think it was incredibly inspirational. Um, and so, um, yeah, I'm an editor. I oversee the peer review process of, gosh, it's been hundreds of manuscripts at this point, and we might even be into the thousands. And so I have a very intimate um, picture of peer review and also kind of a, a, a large landscape uh, perspective as well. Um, but I want to take a step back for just a second and describe the person that I try to keep in mind um, when I start on any peer review process. And, um, keeping in mind that each peer review process is unique. So I think it's science is an extremely creative and individual pursuit, and each process is different. Um, but the person that I try to keep in mind is a young grad student trying to choose a project. And I want that grad student to be able to pick up a paper um, that my journal published and use that as a strong foundation for their science moving forward. Um, and so the reason that I mention that is because I think that it's very easy when we talk about peer review to become very focused on an individual paper or, you know, I'm an author or I'm a reviewer and it's, a, you know, a very kind of narrow version of the experience um, where I, I, I really hope that we can also take a step back and recognize that peer review is something that we do for the whole community 
And it's not just for the community as we see it now, it's the community that we hope for in the future as well. So it's for future scientists and future work. Um, and I bring that up because I like to think of um, this, this question of, so if we're trying to improve peer review, if we want peer review to become better, along which axis should it become better? And I think it should help make science more robust, that that is ultimately the goal of peer review. And we can talk a lot about how to change it structurally, and we can talk about um, the importance of transparency, which is a, a structural and philosophical um, kind of overlay on top of the process. But if peer review itself isn't helping the science, then we're at cross purposes. So for me, the real goal is to try to understand how to use transparency to highlight the, the aspects of peer review that are particularly successful in um, driving science forward in a way that, that helps the future. So, so it's about the scientific foundations of papers in question. Um, and so at the journal that I run, we have two initiatives along those lines right now. The first is that we um, actually publish peer reviews as an article type when they're particularly good. Um, and this does two things. Um, it gives credit to the people who um, did the peer review as like lines on their CVs as published papers. So, um, you know, that's PIs, but often really importantly, that's also trainees. So we really encourage um, trainees to work with PIs on reviews, and it's, it's wonderful to be able to give them that sort of credit um, aligned on their CV. And then it also lets us collect these things in a group so that um, when people are curious about what really good peer reviews look like, we have a place that we can direct them. Um, so that's one initiative. And then the other one is that um, we're the first journal at Cell Press to follow, um, you know, the, the, the lead of many other journals and um, make the whole process transparent. Um, so, so we began this initiative just a couple of months ago. So the first papers that have gone through it are going to be published um, this year, hopefully very soon. <laughs> um, but we're trying to um, make the process even more transparent by including revisions along the way um, so that people can see um, so we're linking to preprints, first of all, and so hopefully um, when, when people look at a cell systems paper that's been published through our peer review process, they be, they'll be able to see the preprint or the initial submission, the reviews that um, responded to it, the author's response, well, our editorial letter, the author's response, and then the next revision um, so that they can reconstruct the process. Um, because I think one of the things that's missing with most transparent peer review right now is that it's very hard to see what the what the reviewers saw in the first place, and so um, it's it's difficult to reconstruct the process, even though it is transparent. So we're trying to improve along those lines. Um, but um, more generally, I think it's incredibly important to be constructive and responsive to the community, and so I look forward to the rest of this conversation. Thanks so much, Quincy. Um, next, I'd like to ask Amy Brand, uh, director of the MIT Press, to talk about the Peer Review Transparency Project, um, which is creating agreed upon terms to describe how a work has been peer reviewed. Um, Amy. Thanks so much, Jess, and, and to others on this panel for the opportunity to celebrate Peer Review Week. Um, I'm sorry that I can't get my camera working. I just gone on. So, you know, we're, we're talking about peer review, and I've always seen it. In, in the context of my career as being something that figures across, you know, academic evaluation and, and advancement. You can talk about it in terms of tenure and promotion, in terms of grant funding, and in terms of publication like we are today. And in the scholarly publishing space, you know, it's how we measure authority and credibility of published work, um, whether you're talking about a journal or, you know, an academic book. Um, I'm part of the university press community, and we see ourselves as forming, forming this kind of multi-university collective uh, of academic peer review and credentialing, and especially for book-centric fields, which tends to be more, you know, humanities and, and um, social sciences, but not, not exclusively. Um, and so, you know, by not signaling directly how a work has been reviewed, and instead relying on, you know, the reputation of a press or a journal brand, we're kind of contributing to the dominance of particular brands and at the same time, I think, you know, missing an opportunity to signal the rigor and excellence of uh, less well-established journals and publishers. And so when we kind of created this peer review transparency project, 
um, it was using the term transparency not so much as in open open identity or open review, but uh, transparent as to the kind of review that a work underwent. Um, personally, I've been concerned with um, misconceptions about the, the rigor or the, the lack of rigor of open access journals and presses. Um, and so the idea behind our PRT project uh, is to divorce that perception of rig rigor from journal brand or publisher brand as a way of um, removing some of the disincentives we see to publish open access. And what we'd like to do, and we're just really getting started, is to provide uh, standardized tagging for the types and levels of peer review that a work has undergone. Um, we're not, I think, the only project working on this. Um, Hermios is as well. Um, but in effect, the idea is that peer review badges function as these independent, uh, you know, journal or press independent uh, signal of quality. Um, and uh, ultimately, we think this will help lessen the kind of stranglehold uh, that we see of, of certain brands, you know, over uh, academic careers, um, you know, in the journal space, certainly Nature Science Cell, or in the book space, you know, more established traditional presses. Fantastic. Thanks so much, Amy. Um, relating to this issue of surfacing kind of metadata or descriptions of peer review, um, I next like to ask Tony to talk a little bit um, about the Transpose project, which Disclosure I'm also involved in. Tony is leader of the Open and Reproducible Research Group at Graz University of Technology. Thanks, Tony. Yeah, hi, can you hear me okay? Yeah? Yes. Okay, great. I am going to share my screen. I decided I made some slides, so I'm going to use them. Oh, how exciting. Thank you. No, you've seen them because they're yours. Okay. Um, so, Transpose um, is a database of journal policies for peer review, co reviewing, and pre printing. Um, I'll get rid of you guys. Put you down the bottom. So, uh, journal practices um, are changing, and for those of us who want journal practices to change, who want to see them become more um, open or transparent, um, one of the problems that, that we, we identified was that maybe researchers don't know if the journals that they want to publish in actually embrace these, um, these practices. Um, and now, journal po uh, policies really steer researcher behavior. So if you really want to publish in, say, nature or science or so, um, the, the way that they expect um, the process to be run does influence how you expect um, this, the, the process of publication to happen. Um, what we found was that journal practices are very often very variable. They're hidden, undefined, or unclear. So, if you want to find um, aspects of journal policy, uh, type of peer review, or whether they allow preprints or so on, you can find yourself going to various different parts of a journal website, or maybe up to the publisher website, um, maybe over to a society website to find all these various pieces of the, of the policies, if you can find them at all. So, um, uh, to counteract this, we um, uh, started a community effort called Transpose, uh, which decided to collect information on journal policies about uh, preprints, um, open peer review, and in particular um, uh, the journals which are doing, um, uh, which allow you to publish uh, the reports or allow you to sign your reviews and so on. Um, and then a, th a third strand was uh, an issue that we identified is the fact that very often the reviews that are being done are being ghostwritten um, by postdocs for more prestigious um, uh, seniors. Um, and we wanted to find out the extent to which journals have explicit policies about this, whether co-reviewers are allowed, um, and if so, what types of uh, credit that they would get for that work that they're actually doing. So we created the, the database, and these are some of the use cases uh, that we identified. So, if I'm an author, and I want to find journals that offer more transparent um, processes. Um, I can go to Transpose. If I'm a librarian and I want to make, um, I want a, a resource to advise researchers, I can use it. Administrators or funders who want to promote open science, um, they can make lists of the journals that allow preprints. 
um, for their researchers. Journalists might need to know media coverage policies for preprint so that they can um, know whether or not um, the, uh, um, the journal allows that. Um, and yeah, as an as basic, and also finally, as an as an advocate or somebody who wants to know about these things, or even as a, a researcher or a, a meta researcher, it's good to know um, which journals are, are doing which practices and to have some form of tracking over time. One I was very I am very um, in favour of open peer review, but one thing that was clear was that there was no resource which actually told us how many journals were actually offering that. So um, this is transpose, and I just thought that I would show you very quickly the resource. So this is um, uh, the database itself. This is the URL. If you go here, you just type in the name of the journal that you would like to see, such as eLife. Um, you find your, your journal. You'll see here that you can click if you want to compare more than one journal policy side by side. But I'll just um, concentrate on this one at the moment. So here we see, for example, that eLife allows, um, it is an open peer review journal, it publishes reports, it uh, publishes author responses, even editorial letters. Um, the reviewer identities can be published, but it's um, not mandatory. Um, and it is um, mandatory that the reviewers consult with each other under an interactive process. You also see here that they have a, um, an explicit policy on co-reviewing. Um, and here you find um, all the information, detailed information about um, uh, what you're allowed to do with your preprints. So um, if you want to get in touch, and in particular, we are a community initiative. So if you want to um, take part, if you want to help populate the database or do community work with us, um, uh, then, yeah, um, I just realized that I don't have the email. I'll, I'll find it later or I'll put it in the chat. Okay, I'm finished. Thanks very much, Tony. Uh, and finally, uh, I, uh, Bahar Mimani, reviewer experience lead at Elsevier, uh, who has also been leading the charge on peer review week uh, uh, this year, um, will tell us about participation in data sharing uh, with the Peer E initiative. Thanks, Jessica, for inviting me and uh, also everyone for making the peer review week such an engaging event. Um, so a bit of a background for myself. I am a physicist by education and I joined Elsevier after doing a postdoc. Um, but my main motivation was like to see if we can change the entire process um, within the publishing companies uh, in such a way that we can make this peer review process more transparent, more engaging, more um, attractive, and also user-friendly. I mean, all of us um, have had experiences with article submission and peer review submissions, and I don't think any of us had liked any of the submission systems that we encountered. Um, so I'm not there yet, but I've done some uh, some progress, I should say. One of the things I did in Elsevier was um, to lead a pilot which was about publishing peer review reports alongside articles and that goes back in 2014 where Crossref was not even uh, accepting article types with anonymous author names because I really wanted these peer review reports to be registered with DOI so we had to come up with all kind of tricks to, to make this happen. Um, we did this pilot for three years and in the meantime, the PRE, which is a European cost action, got its funding and invited uh, stakeholders from publishing companies. So I was a severe representative in PRE. A bit of an information about what is PRE. This is basically a group of researchers from all kinds of scientific backgrounds who think um, that peer review should be a scientific subject and should be studied scientifically. I think all of us in the call can agree with that. And we all have heard anecdotes uh, from editors, from researchers, that transparency improves this or decreases that. But um, as scientists, we should also talk 
evidence-based and try to understand why things happen and with what kind of um, data we can back up our arguments. So my motivation upon joining with, with this working group was, okay, so how can we make this possible to, to run study on peer review process? Um, definitely for that you need data. Usually peer review data are sitting on submission systems, which are not even in some cases owned by publishers or journals in society, um, particularly in society journals. So there I was uh, with the mission to make the data sharing possible. It took us basically um, almost two years to make um, a document that could be agreed between uh, PRE, between the legal department of Elsevier, the legal department of Springer Nature, who was another stakeholder representative, Wiley, um, another one, and um, Royal Society later on. But once that data sharing protocol was signed, it was easy for all of us as representative of publishing companies to just go back to our submission systems and say, hey, this is a data model, these are the requirements, and we want to have that data being shared with this and that responsible person who were the chairs and co-chairs of the PRE. Um, and, and once that the protocol was signed, I reached out to basically all Elsevier journal publishers. Um, by publishers, I mean the internal colleagues who are taking care of a portfolio of journals, group of journals, and, and uh, manage that. So I reached out to them, said, uh, this is PRE, this is how it works, this is the signed agreement. Um, reach out to your journal editors and tell me if you are interested in participating on this study. And that's how I collected 70 journals who wanted to participate from different disciplines, from different um, sizes, some of them society journals, some of them proprietary journals, some of them on the higher percentile, you name it, that uh, impact factor, some of them on the lower parts. And uh, the same did with um, the representative of Wiley, and Springer Nature and Royal Society. So after a while, Piri got a huge group of data points. And what I particularly did with Piri was the analysis of the pilot of publishing peer review report and its impact on review performance. So we looked into the three years of pilot performance of these journals, comparing it with the past five years, and also with a controlled group of journals in the same subject area which didn't participate in the pilot. Um, so we call, with, with the data points we had, I think we had quite a robust number of um, data points to, to basically back up our arguments. We looked into about 10,000 submissions and almost 20,000 referee reports, and we compared the review or acceptance rate of these journals before pilot, after pilot, um, their turnaround time, um, the type of referee, referee um, comment to author that uh, they were writing, the type of recommendation, decision recommendations that reviewers usually are, um, choose for the editor, and also different groups of reviewers. And what we found was that, first of all, um, the pilot, which was um, publishing peer review reports as articles, leaving it up to reviewers to decide whether they want to reveal their identities or not, um, found out that the reviewers um, acceptance rate, so invitation acceptance rate, didn't significantly change. Second, we found also the, uh, there wasn't any statistically significant change between the, the, the turnaround time for reviewers um, before the pilot and after the pilot. Um, we found that professors were more likely to decline uh, during the pilot, while early career researchers were more likely to uh, uh, accept the, the review invitations. In terms of um, the content of the review report, we did a sentiment analysis and didn't find, again, any statistically significant difference between the way they were writing their reports 
and um, before or during the pilot, but we found out that this small group of um, researchers who are young male early career researchers were uh, writing more objective uh, referee reports. Probably that's what Chris was already at the beginning of the talk was talking about. Um, we also found out that only 8% of those reviewers were signing their reports, comments uh, to, to authors to be published. And funny enough, uh, those who were signing their reports were the ones who were most likely recommending minor revisions or accept to the editor. So these were all the findings for the five pilot journals, three of them in health and medicine, no, two of them in health and medicine and three of them in physical sciences and engineering. And uh, of course, this is only five journals, a small sample of the entire disciplines, but it gives us a kind of a um, understanding that um, the pr practice of publishing peer review report in the worst case scenario might not change entirely the reviewer behavior, but at least it adds transparency. It gives the credit to those who uh, really do their share. And in the hindsight, it also changes slightly the editor's attitude in the sense that um, once the journal is starts publishing peer review report, they most likely are going to desk reject manuscripts that shouldn't go to the reviewer at the first place and would send the reviews uh, manuscripts which have something as a as a founding good science to to reviewers so that's all i wanted to share today with you Thank you so much, Fahar. Um, we have a few uh, structured questions that um, I would like to ask of all of the panelists, um, but I also want to welcome any participant on this call to participate. You should feel free to unmute your video and your audio, uh, but please do keep it muted if you're not speaking to reduce background noise. Um, I hope that we can have a discussion um, about what we've heard here. Um, but before doing that, I just want to note that there seems to be a flurry of questions in the chat about Bihar's uh, talk. And so uh, before posing um, one of the more general questions, um, I was hoping that we could, while we have Bihar uh, you know, focused on our screens, uh, if we could ask her perhaps to comment on this uh, either, there's a couple questions here about assessing the objectivity of the reviews right. and the, the quality and what quality means really more more specifically. <laughs> Unfortunately, I, I don't think I mentioned quality, but I mentioned reviewer performance. Um, I, unfortunately, we didn't have any quality means. I mean, probably you all know that um, quality of peer review is hard to define and every journal editor has a different opinion about it. Um, at least in health and medicine, Quincy, you know better than me, at least there, there is this review quality instrument that many journals are using. Um, but in physical sciences and other topics, that review quality instrument doesn't seem to be working. I did another experiment with using review quality uh, instrument, rating qualities, and we, we were finding really like strange results. So definitely other topics need to have an instrument to measure quality. We're not there yet. Um, so we didn't have any means to measure quality. What we did was to look into like the sentiment analysis, basically mapping the, the content based on polarity between zero and one and objectivity between minus one and one. And you can, you can imagine this is not really uh, a very, you know, um, rocket science um, definition of, um, quality but that was the only thing we could play around with and you can find all the data points and our findings um, in the supplementary uh, section of the article I saw that Tony thanks Tony man shared the article that we wrote about this um, and it also our peer review reports because we got really good reviewer comments when we um, su submitted our article to Nature Communications, which was the journal of choice because they are also doing open peer review. <laughs> That's great. Thank you so much, Bahar. Um, I I think that um, 
this is a, a good segue into sort of one question that I would like to pose to everyone on the panel, as well as uh, really just anyone on the call who feels that they might want to comment on this. Um, we've heard of different types of transparency here, signing reviews, publishing the content of reviews, um, you know, publishing analyses, creating badges, or revealing policies. Who is really benefiting from uh, the most from this type of transparency? And um, you know, is there any risk for any parties, whether they be authors, reviewers, editors, or readers, um, in, in having this kind of transparency revealed? I'm curious if anybody has any comments on that. I mean, I think especially, um, you know, maybe I'll ask uh, to start off Chris. Um, I think there's a lot of concern of retribution. Um, and um, I'm, I'm curious if you, you know, you, you mentioned that these are stories that people retell but don't necessarily encounter themselves. Um, I'm, I'm curious if you think of any strategies of, of uh, helping, helping people mitigate the potential risk of transparency. Yeah, I don't know. It's a very emotional subject, isn't it? How do you convince somebody that, you know, they're not going to be damaged by declaring their name, right? I mean, I, but for me, it is, it, is, it is a very personal thing. But like I said about my mental state, I think if I worked in a, in a field where just everybody was, or it's safe to consider that, it's safer to consider that everybody is potentially out there to damage your career if you tell them the truth in a polite and constructive way, that for me is not a space I want to work in, right? But that's a, mm. a personal view, and I will tell people that very, very openly. Because I think at the moment as well, like I say, there's not enough good news stories. So, you know, there's a question came to me on the chat about the scholarship, whether I was whether you value it or you get anything from it at the moment. You start to with publons. Things like publons are good because now you start to be able to get credit for your peer review. It says nothing about how good that peer review is, but at least it's a way of compiling in a structured fashion because at the moment if you don't use publons i think all of that scholarship and all of those days you spend writing a really detailed review for somebody is just lost it's lost to it's lost to the broader scientific population if the peer review report is not published but it's also lost to the authors they can't then value your scholarship which is what we're doing when we're writing papers and presenting right and i see peer reviews being exactly the same as those things and so that's why I really struggle sometimes when people are like, well, this bit has to be secret, but this other bit doesn't. Because for me, it's still, you know, you'd, you'd happily challenge somebody's science in a paper, right? You'd, 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 you'd happily critique it and then stand, you know, you'd go up against whatever came your way after that. But for some reason, review is seen as being a slightly different beast. But yeah, that's my, my sort of take on that. Yeah, thank you. And I just want to call on a question that Amy put in the chat. Um, you know, that she she writes, um, has signing your reviews also been a way of expanding the record of scholarship uh, that you're credited with? And it sounds like from what you're saying about publons, yeah. that, you know, that is the case. Um, yeah. I'm curious if anyone else has any thoughts on sort of the benefits of transparency versus the risks of transparency and whether those are spread across different players. I had a quick question about that that particular thing they're talking about. Should I hang on to it until later? No, go uh, go ahead, oh. Rich. That sounds great. Okay. Yeah. Hi. Hi. My name is Rich. I'm a PhD student um, at the University of Minnesota, and I've heard a lot about like getting credit for your peer reviews and places like Publons and being able to point to peer reviews and saying, "Look at what I did." Um, the part that I'm curious about is whether anybody cares. Um, why do I want credit for my peer review if it's not going to help me get a job or get promoted? Or if the assumption is that I'm doing it and I can list on my CV, look at these publications that I'm a peer reviewer for. Is anybody going to go in and see, oh, well, is he actually being thoughtful? I have one, just one, one, one response to that. I think if to become an editor at a journal, you need to demonstrate that you've partaken in peer review, right? So you want to get, and that, and that is a clear way you could get promoted, right? Is one evidence of prestige and esteem to get an editorship at a journal, and it's contingent on actually having partaken actively in the peer review process. Maybe that's rather than your 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 uh, tenure committee. Let's say they may not care about your fancy badges, but 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 more broadly speaking, somebody who's interviewing you may sort of for an editorship might do. 
Yeah, so this is this is Quincy here, and I, I'd like to um, say a couple of things about all this. The first thing is that I like what Mario just put in the chat. Um, so, so he said, as a researcher, transparency helps us research the changes that occur from submitted to published versions, which is information that is usually unavailable to researchers. I think that's really true. Um, but I think that it does something more broadly than that, which is it reminds us that science is a process, that it's not perfect, and that a plurality of voices is really helpful and that scholarship is a generous act. Um, and I think that um, those are all very kind of idealistic things that um, we can contribute to by taking part in peer review in a transparent um, way where we're personally accountable for uh, what we say and we're um, trying very hard to actually uh, further the scholarship of someone else. Um, so to answer the, the question that came up, I think in the short term, you might not get credit. And if the, if the goal is to get personal credit right now, um, you know, we have a mechanism, but it's, you know, it is, it's, it's not, my journal has a mechanism, but that's sort of not why I'm here. I think that the more exciting thing is that, um, you know, this sort of notion of quiet change throughout the field, that you're participating in something that is, is bigger and needed. Thanks I also much. want to add something, Mario again, uh, by the way, Mario is also one of the PRE members. Um, he um, mentions that in, in the promotion committee, uh, they had to men they had to mm, write how many reviews they have done for which journals, which is not necessarily a good thing. Um, quantifying is always, a, has a kind of a mm, side effect. But I, I would say, um, it should come from um, not only journals, but also from institutions and funders to appreciate researchers' role on progress of science in their peer review kind of um, role. Because um, if you are only going to be um, promoted or given a position or a grant based on your publications in this and that journal, um, while you are spending your probably weekends, late evenings, your uh, summer holidays, um, in between flights, <laughs> on the trains. I mean, I'm doing this and I, I have a partner who is, who is doing this. So you're, you're sacrificing, sacrificing your, your free times to do the review, but not getting the proper credit for that from your institutions. And, an anecdote I heard in a in a conference, someone said, well, actually, I stopped using Publons because my supervisor show well, I showed him Publons and he, he saw the number of reviews I've done and he was like, you should be doing what I want you to do and not reviewing. I mean, that mindset should be, should be changed. The eyes find new ways of being terrible. Wow. It's like, <laughs> So um, I'm curious if any um, anyone, especially someone who hasn't spoken yet, um, would be interested in commenting on these uh, these ideas. Um, and, you know, especially this this concept of who benefits from transparency, and also, you know, what or alternatively, um, how does transparency? How complete is are these different? Uh, directions of transparency toward actually revealing what we think of as quality and peer review. Well, <clears throat> can I go? Or I will go. Um, I guess the publishing reports, I mean, we can't really agree on, on what quality and peer review is. Um, and Mario said that all the instruments are I'm, I'm very good, but at least you can actually see the reviews that are going on. And I, I think that um, a, a real benefit there is for open access journals, which still have this stigma of uh, peer review light or, or so on, um, to actually show the rigor of their processes. Um, and, and I think that maybe a risk there for the more established journals is that it shows up that maybe their processes aren't as rigorous as they claim, um, given the fact that they they put so much weight on the on 
we have 95% rejection rates and our, reju our uh, peer review is, is the most rigorous, you know? So um, they might be two sets of winners and losers. Great, and um, I think um, you know that certainly is. Uh, I think you're making a great point there that you know the the mechanisms that we are currently using to judge quality may not necessarily map onto uh, the new uh, information that becomes available with with transparency. Um, I I also just um, want to to ask you know how vulnerable are these various different approaches to transparency? to unintended consequences, to misinterpretations or misunderstandings? How complete are they um, in, in uh, representing what went on? And I'm, I'm curious to hear also from any of the panelists uh, to talk about the uh, type of transparency that you've brought up today or from others as well. Just thinking, Jessica, one of the, and, and everybody out there on the call, one of the kind of better, not better, but more compelling arguments I heard from somebody once about why you shouldn't sign peer review is because if you're a famous name, then it can start to actually start weighting how seriously authors should take on board the suggestion. So, you know, if you basically have the same review report and then, you know, Big Prof X signs it versus early career researcher Y or something, then, you know, the, the Big Prof who's written that paper might just say, well, you know, my, my golfing buddy wrote this review, so I better take it, you know, seriously because he's dead clever. Whereas the early career researcher one, they could just blow it off. I mean, that's one thing I heard why you wouldn't want to sign it. And I don't think that's an unintended consequence per se, but it is certainly well, I guess it sort of is, right? It's one thing that if you sign it, then you could start actually making some sort of hierarchy around opinion. I don't know what other people think. I think that's true. I also, so this is Quincy here. Um, I'm, I'm worried about the following. So um, I've heard of people, young researchers, who are keenly aware of the big dogs in the field and are worried that, um, you know, if they're critical of the big dog's work, that there'll be um, consequences later on grant panels or whatnot. And I think that that's something, like, I, I think that people who are lucky to be in fields that don't behave that way um, are, are very lucky in that, that perhaps um, we don't know what the dominant behavior across all fields is. So that's something that I think to keep aware of. But the other thing has to do with, um, sort of willingness to put yourself out there. And and I am still worried um, that there is uh, gender implications here. Um, so I think that we need some studies about whether or not um, men and women are sort of equally likely to sign reviews, equally likely to engage in transparent processes. Um, and again, I'm not trying to be um, sort of, uh, I, I'm not trying, I, I'm not trying to be binary in my, um, my thinking along gender lines. I'm just saying um, that that more data needs to be to be gathered. Um, so that's one of the things that we did when we launched the the peer review effort at my journal is that we cl were collecting information about career stage um, and gender identity of the first authors of papers and the last authors of papers in an effort to see whether or not patterns emerge. Um, because it opt uh, patterns emerge around opting in and opting out of the transparent process. Um, just because I think it's, if, if patterns do emerge, then as a community, it's very important to talk about those and try to understand what they mean. Um, and if they don't emerge, then that's, that's great information to know as well. But I think that that's something that, um, that we should be um, alive to um, as, as a scientific community. I think That's one of the, go ahead, sorry. One of the benefits of um, transparent peer review is that journals and editors mm, start looking into their journal data and try to back up their arguments with data points. I mean, Kinsey is now looking into gender 
of those who sign in uh, their reports or those who opt out from revealing their identities. And, and if you compare this entire body of, you know, research on the process itself with journals that are being under like single blind or double blind forever, there is not much going on um, at their end. I mean, I know journals that are running under double blind, knowing that it's not really perfect and double blind is not really um, ensuring that reviewers cannot guess the author's identities, but still they are like, this is the norm and we're gonna do it. So that, that kind of a mindset that journals a journal and, and journal editors have for transparent peer review is not something that you could see in journals that are running under single or double blind for ages and not even giving it a try because for that you really need to to have that kind of a mindset i need to look into my data i need to find out whether i'm gonna monitor something and i'm gonna prove a hypothesis or not that itself, I think, is a is a valuable uh, thing. Yeah, from my perspective, one of the things that would be the most interesting is um, is <laughs> the identity of the the authors of the papers were blinded, um, and reviewers perhaps or not. I mean, that would be a very interesting flip. Um, yeah, but I also I think that. Um, that uh, so just to be very clear about the transparent process that we're running, the reviewer identities are remain confidential and choose unless reviewers choose to reveal themselves because I think that um, there's transparency of thinking and then there's transparency of identity and I'm not and I, I'm trying to be kind of mindful about the notion of unintended consequences on both sides. I see some great uh, discussion in, in the chat, um, but uh, I just want to, given that we're coming up on the hour, uh, just ask if anyone um, who is on the call has any other comments or questions or uh, ideas that they might want to discuss. Um, and please feel free to, to just unmute, take yourself off mute and, uh, and speak. Sorry, just Maybe. one question to Quincy. Sorry about um, there was a. I mean, there was a. You, yeah, I think you mentioned about the kind of trust in science and the and the robustness of the process and that being a really important thing. Um, because there was a report recently, was there not, in the US around the public perception of science and the the biggest sort of motivator it seemed to be for the public's belief in science which is really in the teeth of a terrible storm at the moment right both sides of the pond and all around the world let's say um was the fact that scientists were being transparent that they you know that whether the public knew about all the things we're talking about was sort of irrelevant what they needed to be reassured was is the things which you know tony just alluded to there that there was this transparency and you could see how things had evolved through the peer review process and um it seems like what we're talking about here is one of the really big deals, not just for us personally, but for the wider world, really, given what I read in that report, at least. I don't know, if, maybe some of you were co-authors on it, I'm not sure you're going to tell me now, but I don't know what your, your collective views were on that. But. Um, I, I think that the public perception of science, I mean, it's just completely heartbreaking and <laughs> um, that as scientists, gosh, I mean, <sighs> I don't know where to begin with trying to help the public perception of science, um, but as a scientist, I think our perception of science, um, that we need to do better to believe in it ourselves. Um, I think that a lot of people think that the peer review process is broken, that, that public papers that are not very good are being published in very high places, that there's a, um, you know, people talk about the reproducibility crisis. I think there's a deep robustness crisis in the biological sciences. Um, my personal feeling is that um, excitement takes uh, holds too much sway over rigor. 
and that that's hurt an entire generation of scientists. Um, so I think that um, being willing to have slower, deeper, uh, more uh, sort of intellectually difficult and detailed in the right ways conversations about science can do nothing but level the playing field and improve our own faith in how science works. Um, and that's really the, the thing that I'm hoping for, if that makes any kind of sense. And so I hope that if we can do better, maybe that the public will, will see that ultimately. Um, but I guess it's one of those things where can control what you can control. And <laughs> right now I can, you know, kind of try to do the very best by each paper that I handle. Um, but yeah, I don't know if that answers the mean, question or not. But so I know that we live in a, we still live in a world where there are people like there's a flat earth society. And the, the anti climate science lobby is very strong and and there's these celebrities promoting anti vaccinations, but I was just looking at that um, report in science last. Uh, in June, and the level of trust in scientists is very high, like, especially if you compare it to other um, public institutions, like politicians or the press or whatever levels of trust. In science are really, really high um, and so. Yeah, there's um, there's lots we can do to better communicate science, no doubt. But one one uh, thought which uh, was against the kind of publication of of reviews, um, which uh, somebody brought up at one meeting, was the possible weaponization of this. Like the more that you show the background of, that science is a process, the more that so if there's a climate science paper, let's say it says climate science is real, believe it. But one of the reviewers kind of thought that there was one issue or something, and people in the in this anti climate science community might pick up on that and use that as a way of saying, oh, uh, they knew that behind the scenes they knew this was flawed and pushed it through into publication. You know what I mean? This kind of where transparency can um, uh, can be used against science, uh, which I don't think is a reason not to do it. I'm just um, arguing for the sake of it. I could argue with that, Tony, because um, the anti-climate people don't believe in any published research on climate change. So they, if they don't even look into the articles, they wouldn't even bother to look into the peer review reports. All right. Um, thank you for this, uh, this really interesting uh, direction and this concept of representing quality to the broader public. I think it's a really great note to end on um, as we, especially um, uh, with uh, climate marches happening all around us around the world today, uh, especially pertinent issue. Um, I want to thank everyone for joining this call and also especially our uh, speakers for uh, sharing their views. Um, uh, Victoria and I will come up with a few notes uh, from the call, and uh, we also have a recording that we can post online. Um, so thank you all so much for uh, joining us. Happy Peer Review Week, um, and we hope to see you on another ASAP Bio call or event at some point in the near future. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thanks, Bye. everyone. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye.